This is the Anker Solix C1000 Gen 2 portable power station, a more compact upgrade to the original. Now with what Anker claims is a Guinness World Record for AC charging speed, four 2000 watt AC outlets, and two high power 140 watt USB-C ports. I've been testing charging speed, how it handles high demand appliances, solar performance, efficiency, and standby drain. I'll show where it excels, where it could improve, and whether it deserves a spot on your shortlist. And we'll run through the key features as we go. So let's take a closer look. The power station comes with a mains charging cable, a car charging cable with an XT60 connector, and a quick start guide. You can download a complete user manual from Anchor's website. This is the lightest 1024 watt hour power station I've tested to date at just 11.3 kilograms. Impressive considering it uses long lasting LFP batteries rated for 4,000 charge cycles. It's also the most compact one kilowatt hour unit I've tested. Although the Bluetti Elite 100 V2 I'll be reviewing soon is narrower with its integrated rear handle. You can see its dimensions on the screen. I'll be comparing the Anker to all its main competitors in an upcoming video. So make sure you subscribe if you don't want to miss it. Like most Anker products I've looked at, the build quality is excellent, but as with most power stations, there's no weatherproof rating. Its lightweight and compact design makes it very portable. It's comfortably carryable with one hand, which is super convenient. And considering how small it is, it's not lacking any inputs or outputs. Around the front, there's a 12 watt USB A port, a 15 watt USB C port, and two 140 watt USB C ports. Below are four 2000 watt AC outlets in the UK, the US gets five sockets. There's a button to turn on the AC outlets. The left side of the unit has the fast charging mains input and the XT60 DC input for charging off your car or solar panels. The right of the unit has the car outlet underneath a rubber flap. It also has its own power button. A long press of the main power button turns the unit and the USB ports on. The Anker has one of the clearest and most user-friendly displays I've seen on a power station coming to life with a neat little animation. Pressing the button again switches to a more detailed view of inputs and outputs. You can set a timeout for the display in the accompanying app. When plugged into mains, there's even a clock screensaver you can enable, which is a nice touch. A long press turns the unit off. The Anker's biggest claim to fame is its Guinness World Record 49 minute AC charging at 1600 watts using the supplied standard mains lead. You do need to enable ultra fast charging in the app. In my measurements, it got to 80% charge in just 36 minutes, and it managed to beat its own record, completing a full charge from completely flat in 47 minutes, which is very impressive. The next fastest one kilowatt power station I've tested, the DJI Power 1000 V2 took 53 minutes. You can definitely hear the fans charging at full speed. I measured around 42 decibels one meter away. That's not particularly loud, but the fans vary their speed quite a bit, which makes them more noticeable. The unit got to around 48 Celsius, charging at full speed, which I measured with my thermal imaging camera. In the app, you can drop the charging speed all the way down to 100 watts in 100 watt increments. Anker labels 600 watts as silent charging, and it is a lot quieter, but not silent. I found dropping down to 200 watts really did get you silent charging. The fans turn off, which would be handy if you're sleeping close to the unit. All these measurements were taken with ambient temperatures around 20 degrees Celsius. They might vary in warmer conditions. Using the supplied cable, you can charge the power station at around 100 watts from your car's 12 volt outlet. It would take over 10 hours for a full charge. If your vehicle has a 24 volt output, you can use that for faster charging, which I confirmed with my bench power supply. Finally, the Anker has an integrated MPPT controller for solar charging at up to 600 watts. I tested solar charging with their PS100 100 watt portable solar panel. This comes with an MC4 adapter cable to connect straight into the power station's XT60 input. It's a modest output for a solar panel but that does make it fairly lightweight at 4.7 kilograms. And together with its compact size and large carry handle, it's extremely portable and quick to set up. Magnets keep it folded and it takes less than a minute to open it up and adjust the integrated feet for the best view of the sun. It also has an IP67 waterproof rating, which is great to see. Typically, the sun barely made an appearance when I first tested the panel, so I only got around 20 watts. But I tried again another day and got 70 watts. The solar input is limited to only 8.2 amps at voltages between 11 and 28 volts. So since this panel is rated at 24.5 volts, 4.1 amps, even if you connected three in parallel, 
you won't get much more than 200 watts with panels like this. To get anywhere near the 600 watts maximum, you'll need to use higher voltage panels. I did try connecting two 31.3 volt Renogy 200 watt panels in parallel and got around 170 watts, but higher voltage panels would be better. These panels are still under 30 volts in typical conditions. Between 28 and 60 volts, the inputs support up to 14.5 amps. I use my bench power supply to approximate an ideal setup in sunny conditions. In my test at 40 volts and above, I can achieve the anchor power station 600 watt maximum solar input. You'd need the solar panels connected in parallel so as not to exceed the 60 volt limit. You can also charge off mains while solar charging. The anchor unit will prioritize your solar input. So it will use your solar first and only top up with mains as needed. Since you can set both the mains charging speed and a charging time of use or TOU schedule in the app, you could make the most of both solar charging and cheap electricity rates to keep the power station topped up as economically as possible. I'll cover this in a little more detail later in the video. The Anker Solix C1000 Gen 2 has a well-sized 2000 watt AC inverter. Not quite as powerful as a DJI 1000 V2, but still plenty for most devices you're likely to plug in and 200 watts more than the EcoFlow Delta II and Bluetti Elite 100 V2. There's a generous four outlets in the UK, five in the US, all with a pure sine wave output important for sensitive electronics, which I confirmed with my oscilloscope. I could run most household items, including a 2000 watt fan heater, a 1600 watt hairdryer, and my 12,000 BTU portable air conditioning unit, in this case running in heating mode. When the compressor kicks in, the spike in output can overload some less powerful power stations. There is one feature of the anchor I'm not so keen on. If you plug in a device that exceeds 2000 watts but stays under 2400 watts, the power station will use its surge pad technology to keep it running. But by lowering the voltage, the actual output power still can't exceed 2000 watts. EcoFlow and Bluetti also have this feature, but they let you disable it in their apps. Unfortunately, just like on the Anker Powerhouse 757 I tested a while back, Anker doesn't give you that option. It's fine for resistive loads like heaters, but I'd be cautious with sensitive electronics, especially if you're already close to 2000 watts across the other sockets. Trying to deliberately overload the unit with a 2000 watt heater and a 1600 watt hairdryer that I ramped up with a voltage regulator, you can see that initially the power station drops to exactly 2000 watts, but eventually I get an overload error and the AC shuts off. You can turn the AC back on again after around 30 seconds. To really put the inverter to the test, I ran my usual machinery test in the garage. It ran my 1800 watt Bosch sliding mitre saw perfectly, and it could run my 14 inch bandsaw, which has an induction motor with a large startup draw, which can trip some power stations. It couldn't run my 1800 watt table saw, also with an induction motor. The startup current was too high. Anker specifies a peak output to 3000 watts, but induction motors can draw many times their rated power on startup. AC inverters can use a fair bit of power even when they have no load attached. By default, the anchor turns off its inverter after 15 minutes when it's not in use, or using below 20 watts. But I turned off smart AC output mode to test the parasitic drain. Starting with 100% charge, I left it overnight for 12 hours with no load attached. It had 80% capacity remaining, so the inverter is using around 17 watts even without a load, which is about average. It's a fair bit better than the DJI and just marginally worse than the EcoFlow Delta II. With a constant one kilowatt resistive load from an electric heater and an energy monitoring plug, I measured the usable capacity of the 1024 watt hour battery of the power station. It ran for just over 54 minutes and used 907 watt hours. That's 89% efficiency, which is a very good result. The Anker has a standard DC car outlet with up to 10 amps of output. I tested the efficiency of the DC subsystem with a load tester set at 8 amps. I measured 844 watt hours, which is a decent 86% efficiency. I measured the parasitic drain of the DC output, this time disabling the car output power saving mode. By default, when enabled, the output would turn off if the power is below 3 watts for 5 hours. After 12 hours, the battery was still at 100%, so there was no measurable parasitic drain, which is impressive. So even though the DC subsystem is a little less efficient than the AC, with no measurable parasitic drain, you're better off running intermittent devices like this portable fridge off the car outlet. There are four USB outputs which come on with the unit. There's a legacy USB-A port that doesn't support any fast charging standards, maxing out at 12 watts or 5 volts at 2.4 amps. And rather surprisingly, the USB-C port beside it has no fast charging support either. 
maxing out at 15 watts or 5 volts at 3 amps. And both ports have a maximum combined output of 20 watts. So these really are for your less demanding tech. Fortunately, there are two 140 watt USB-C ports that support almost every fast charging standard under the sun and both ports can be used at their maximum for combined 280 watt total output. To test this, I charged my Anker power bank at its full 140 watts and ran a load tester off the other port at 140 watts. As well as charging power banks, these ports will fast charge power hungry laptops like MacBook Pros, and as more devices switch across to USB C charging, they'll only get more useful. Note you will need to use an EPR rated cable to get 140 watts or 28 volts at 5 amps. I also tested charging very low power items like my AirPods Pro, which only draw around 1 watt. They kept charging for more than 30 minutes, even with the device timeout in the app set to 30 minutes. So it doesn't prematurely cut off very low power devices. The Anker does support pass-through charging, so you can charge the unit and use all the outputs at the same time. Unfortunately, there are no wireless charging pads on the Anker. These have become less popular with power stations, which is a shame. There's certainly space for at least one on top of the unit, which would be very handy. Like most power stations, the Anker has a UPS or uninterruptible power supply mode. When AC devices are connected with a power station plugged into mains power, those devices bypass the internal battery and run directly off the mains. If there's a power outage, the switch over to battery power occurs almost instantly, within 10 milliseconds on the anchor, which is as fast as DJI and Bluetti. I tested this with my desktop computer running an intensive graphics benchmark, and it handled the transition flawlessly. I also measured the transfer time with an oscilloscope. There's a very clean break as a battery switches over, and the transfer time was less than 10 milliseconds as spec. I've briefly mentioned the accompanying smartphone app, but it is very comprehensive and user-friendly. It also works over Wi-Fi, so you can monitor and control the power station remotely. It's also handy in bright sunlight where it's difficult to read the screen. As I alluded to earlier, the TOU or time of use mode is interesting if you're using the device in your home. For example, I could use this power station in my office at the back of the garden with a couple of solar panels. Since I'm on a smart tower from the UK supplier Octopus, I get very cheap electricity between 11.30pm and 5.30am. I can set a schedule to charge the power station then, so ideally I'm either running off free solar energy or this cheaper rate. There's also a storm guard feature to preemptively fast charge the unit if a storm is forecast. The Anker Solix C1000 Gen 2 is one of the most complete and well-rounded 1kWh power stations I've tested. It's compact and lightweight, has extremely fast AC charging, a good range of outputs, integrated solar charging, and one of the best LCD screens and apps in its class. It's one of the most efficient power stations I've tested too. It's great to see solar charging built in, unlike the DJI I reviewed recently. But to reach the full 600 watts, you need higher voltage, heavier, and more expensive panels. Cheaper, more compact panels tend to sit in the 11 to 28 volt range, which is limited to 8.2 amps. Even if you connect a few of them in parallel, you'll only see around 200 watts. To get anywhere near 600 watts, you need panels in the 28 to 60 volt range to take advantage of the higher 14.5 amp input. I'd also like to see an option to disable Anker's surge pad in the app. At the moment, if you're running close to the 2000 watt AC limit, the unit will drop voltage on all its outlets to stay under its limit, which isn't ideal for any sensitive electronics you have plugged in. I really hope Anker can address this with a firmware update. Finally, it's worth noting Anker has dropped the floodlight built into the first generation of this power station, which was very handy for a power cut or for camping. And they also dropped the expansion port. So unlike the EcoFlow and DJI, you can't expand the capacity of this power station. I'm not sure how common it is for people to add expansion batteries to one kilowatt hour units, but it's still something to note. Overall though, this power station has to be on your shortlist if you're considering a one kilowatt hour unit and it comes with a five year warranty and what should be established after sales support from a reputable brand. I will be comparing it directly to the DJI, EcoFlow and Bluetti in an upcoming video. So if you want to see how they compete head to head, make sure you're subscribed. If you found this review helpful, please give the video a thumbs up. It really helps the channel. I read every comment and do my best to respond. So if you've got any questions, feedback or your own experience with this power station, let me know down below. If you'd like to support the channel, you'll find affiliate links down in the description. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and tapping the bell. I release new tech videos every week. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.